very much for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Steve McMenamin. I'm your host for today, uh, today's event, which is part of the ongoing series of the Greenwich Roundtable. Our topic this morning, uh, investment and economic implications of recent public policy actions, is our attempt to understand the seismic events emanating from Washington and beyond. Uh, today we'll hear from two former insiders and hi two highly respected experts. Sorry, we have no hedge funds. <laughs> uh, I'll briefly introduce them after I say this. Our speakers' views are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of the Greenwich Roundtable, its members, or its trustees. Uh, Michael Lewitt, unfortunately, had a family emergency. He couldn't join us today. He sends us sincere regrets. Keith Fisher is an old friend of the Roundtable and the co-head of BlackRock's Fixed Income Portfolio Group, a member of the Executive Committee and Chairman of BlackRock Asia. Uh, before BlackRock... Mr. Fisher was the Undersecretary of Treasury for Domestic Finance, as well as the manager of the open market account at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Peter is considered to be one of, if not the most, thoughtful people on the intersection of public policy and the investment markets. Sitting to Peter's left, Michael Boland is a partner at Johnson, Madigan, Peck, Boland & Stewart, one of Washington's most influential lobbying firms. He has led the legislative and policy-making strategy for companies such as Verizon, Bank of New York, Time Warner, and Charles Schwab. Before that, he ran one of the leading consulting firms in D.C., as well as serving as chief counsel to Trent Lott, the leadership of the House of Representatives, and the House Energy and Commerce Committee. And the moderator of the Greenwich Roundtable today is Paul Isaac. Paul is the chief investment officer of Cadogan, the New York-based fund of funds. He is also a member of the programming committee, the chairman of the polling project, our polling project, with Quinnipiac University, and one of the smartest investors in the round table. Paul, would you set us up for today's discussion? Well, thank you, Steve. Um, the, uh, in a time that's, sort of, that's seen more interventions in the Betty Ford Clinic, uh, it's become the, uh, I'm reminded of the old Stan Freeberg line that um, I try to stay cynical, but it's hard to keep up. And the, and we certainly, in a, in a, dynamic situation where uh, not only the individual events are important, but the overall flow of individual events may be uh, showing patterns where the whole will be more than some of its parts. This has become a, a particularly timely uh, topic, and uh, our hope is that uh, in, with two such knowledgeable speakers dealing with such far-reaching subjects, that we'll be able to lay the groundwork for a further discussion in the Q&A. So with that, uh, I'll ask Peter if you'd sort of Take it away. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be back uh, here for breakfast. Um, I think it's becoming a, a regular event for me every year or so, 18 months or so. Um, the question posed to me reminds me of uh, when my son many years ago came back from his first full day of school at about age four or five. And uh, my wife asked him, uh, so what happened at school today? And he gave a sigh and said, there's too much to tell. <laughs> and uh, that was the beginning of our relationship with our son trying to squeeze information out of him um, I'm afraid when you ask me about what's uh, the intersection of public policy and these interventions and the investment implication the short answer is there's too much to tell in uh, 12 to 15 minutes so I'm going to jump around a little bit uh, maybe a little eclectic but let me um, see if I can set the table for a good discussion um, two key questions. Uh, at what level of revenues will the financial sector stabilize? If we can't answer that, we haven't got to a bottom yet. Um, secondly, will we investors have to price into our expectations the probability of zero inflation or deflation? That's different from whether we have one month reading, uh, whether we're going to have to price it into our expectations. That those, on those two issues hang the investment outlook and how we should all think about things going forward. Uh, a conclusion I will offer, uh, but I've been offering this like a broken record for some time, we're going to have to learn that it's not about sectors anymore. We're going to have to break the sector habit. Uh, asset allocation is a very important discipline, but uh, if you can't get past that and think about quality, think about the cash flows you're lending against, who's going to be a winner and who's going to be a loser in whatever sector, you're not going to be in the game over the next five years. Um, 
That's uh, my quick summary. Next, um, I think one of the most unhelpful things are those voices who were saying this is just about fear itself, et cetera, et cetera. I wish that were so. There certainly is a loss of confidence that matters, but it doesn't just begin with some irrational piece of fear. We have a math problem. We all borrowed too much money, and most painfully, our banking system borrowed too much money. Our financial system, the intermediaries who convert our savings into investment, levered themselves up too far. And that's the math problem that is overhanging us and against which we have to think about uh, the public policy actions. And we have to get our mind around the scale of this problem. So now, the public policy reactions to uh, the events of the last 18 months come in three phases. Uh, phase one, from August of 07 to February of 08, uh, this was the traditional response. We had some easing of monetary policy in the United States, but nowhere else in the world. Uh, we had a little fiscal stimulus in the beginning of last year from the United States, this beginning of this year from our Congress. And uh, we had the dominant part of this phase was special liquidity facilities, special central bank lending. Uh, and that was universal around the world. They stepped up and did a lot of exotic things with lending programs. Now, the problem with this phase of the response uh, was, is very simple. Just say this to yourself three times softly under your breath. You can't delever by borrowing money, <laughs> even from the central bank. So it's nice that the central banks are there lending, liquefying the markets in the way central banks can do, but it's inadequate to the challenge. If the challenge is one of delevering, borrowing more money doesn't really get you very far even when you borrow it from the central bank. And that's the problem with phase one, which carried us uh, to uh, February of this year. Now, from March to September of this year, we moved into phase two, which the authorities spent imploring the financial sector to recapitalize itself, please. Uh, and we started this phase uh, in the first 10 days of March of this year. I think the entire leadership of the Treasury and the Federal Reserve, the senior leaders, each one to a man gave a speech saying, banks will have to raise more capital. And the problem with this phase is um, a little problem that the only thing worse than crying fire in a crowded theater is when the fire marshal does it himself. <laughs> it's a little problem of dilution, of pre-announcing a capital raise that the entire banking system needs to raise more capital. If you don't do it quickly, uh, Macbeth having the last best word on how to recapitalize a bank or how to close a bank. Um, if you don't do it quickly, you're frightening investors. And in the first 10 days of March, we destroyed $200 billion worth of the market cap of the top 20 financial firms in the United States. And on the 10th day, Bear Stearns died, which should be, have been a surprise to no one. If we're frightening investors, the only way they can protect themselves is by selling. Um, well, you're going to run down uh, confidence, and that's a little problem. This was uh, phase two. And then that played out in slow motion over the summer uh, with the same sequence for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. The authorities giving speeches demanding they raise more capital, investors being fearful of dilution, selling, then it becoming more urgent and the authorities giving more speeches, uh, asking Congress for a bazooka so they could force dilution on Fannie and Freddie. That did not enhance confidence. And we played the story out over the summer and into September. Now, I'm often asked, um, was it a mistake to uh, let Lehman Brothers fail in mid-September? And my answer is, since I've got Irish lineage, I can tell this old joke, which is uh, to two Dubliners, one asks the other, how do you get to Paris? And the answer is, don't start in Dublin. <laughs> so if the question is, September 14th, should you let Lehman Brothers survive or fail? That's like starting in Dublin. Uh, the failure was not forcing a merger in May and June and not recapitalizing Fannie and Freddie quickly and promptly in June also and letting them bleed to death over the summer. I'm not a fatalist. I don't think this crisis has to be as bad as it has become. Uh, it mattered how we acted. And I think the disruption of confidence and the disruption of the housing market and the leg down, uh, you, the, the collapse in retail sales started in August. Uh, it did not start last May. 
and I think uh, that matters. Um, finally, phase three, as painful and awkward as it is for all of us, uh, phase three uh, began in mid-September, and this is when the authorities began to get their hands around the scale of the problem. Um, so if a, house, if a household borrows too much money, they, their balance sheet is too big, they bought too big a house, they have too big a mortgage, how do we know it's too big? Too big compared to revenues, too big compared to their income. If a bank has too big a balance sheet, borrowed too much money, how do we know? It's compared to its revenues. The banking system as a whole, it's the same. So uh, these are rough figures, and I'm borrowing them from a friend, and I wasn't able to replicate them, but these are the scale of other numbers. From the end of 06 to mid-June of 08, the top 50 financial intermediaries in the world grew their balance sheets by some number around 12 to 14 trillion from some number like 36 to some number like 50. Now, what if run rate revenues now aren't the same as they were in 06 or 07? What if there's some year like 04 or 03 or 01? And we have to shrink the balance sheet, the aggregate balance sheet of the financial system back to some size that its revenues can be sustained. It's not about the credit quality of Mr. and Mrs. Smith's individual mortgage. It's about this balance sheet. This aggregate balance sheet's way too big. Some number like 10 trillion, using data from last June, or more. Um, now there are only three things that can happen now. Prices can fall because banks can sell these assets to each other. But if the whole system's got to shrink, uh, prices have to fall, or the system doesn't shrink. Uh, now, there's a little problem here. The financial system represents the collective savings of the rest of us, the household and the corporate and the farm sector. So there's nobody left but the government. So when the problem gets this big, there are only three things that can happen. Prices can fall uh, until we get to stable revenues, a stable balance sheet to revenue relationship. Um, or the government can buy the assets or the government can inject equity and be a more patient uh, investor that's willing to take a lower return on equity for a while than might otherwise be the case. That's it. If you come up at this macro level, you've got to come up with, I, I, don't, I think it's again, we're down to math. There's nobody left. So as awkward and messy and sloppy and poorly described as uh, the TARP has been uh, and what the Secretary Polson has been up to, I'm afraid they're in this space where this is the choice. We can just watch prices keep falling. It goes back to my first uh, uh, the question is, at what level does debt to income of the financial sector stabilize? We're not going to stabilize house prices in America until debt to income stabilizes for the household sector. That's the necessary condition. Uh, we're not going to stabilize asset prices until the banking system's balance sheet, banking system broadly defined, until its balance sheet can start growing again, until it's stable relative to its revenues, and shrinking the assets back to some earlier period is going to be very painful. Let me just touch on the other issues. Um, um, inflation, deflation. Uh, for investors, um, you need to have an opinion today about whether you think we're going to have see a 5% Treasury 10-year note or a 2.5% Treasury 10-year note first. And that's going to matter. Now, I think the trick there is to figure out whether you think, as I said, we're going to have to worry about zero inflation or deflation more than just a one-month observation as we had yesterday. Now, is this something we're going to have to really think about and price into our expectations the forward inflation rate break-even curve is pricing in two years of deflation. Lots of technicals, lots of noise, a lot of people puking positions, so maybe that's part of it. There's some technicals in the way the inflation index is corrected, but forecasting two years of deflation and then a return to essentially trend rate inflation by 2011-2012. That is Goldilocks outcome. That suggests the capacity utilization of the economy returns to full utilization by the end of 2011. That's terrific. But the little trick we're going to have is if we really have to look at an extended period of deflation, we've got to decide whether a 4% 10-year Treasury note is about the best returning asset we can find. If you've got 1% deflation and 4% nominal, you've got a 5% real return on a riskless asset. 
Any hedge funds want to raise their hands and say, I'm shooting for higher than 5% real risk-adjusted? I don't think so. That's a fabulous return. I don't think most of us are going to sit around and watch that there for very long. However, if we're thinking, ah, oh, that's just a passing fancy, we're not really having deflation, we're going to be right back to 3% inflation any day now, then that 4% um, 10-year note looks very different. That's going to color all the investment decisions we make. You, you, you can't not have to think about your reference rate, what the riskless rate is, and what the alternative deployment of your capital is. Um, finally, I'll just come back and echo um, what I said at the outset. Um, this is a painful recession. Uh, the government's throwing everything at can it, can it, and I think that's right. It's awkward. Um, we just, the alternative, the question isn't whether we like all the crazy things the government's doing. The question is what Roberta Flack posed uh, 25 years ago compared to what? We don't get to compare this to 2005. We really do have to think about comparing this to some year more like 81 or more like uh, 32 or 31, if we don't get the right answer. I'll close by putting this in perspective. Um, when Paul Volcker, most of us are old enough here to have a vivid memory of this, Paul Volcker squeezed inflation out of the system. He tightened monetary policy extraordinarily uh, to crush inflation and created back-to-back uh, -back recessions with a minus 8% GDP quarter in 1980. The BAA spread widened about 350 basis points over three years over both those recessions. That's the credit shock the economy took from what he did. We've just widened the BAA spread by 400 basis points in one year. So that's the credit shock our real economy is taking now. Um, you can think of it also as an investment opportunity. Those are pretty wide spreads. Uh, might want to be a lender now when the banks can't be. Uh, but you have to come back to winners and losers. There I am. I'm done. I don't want to start off with um, anything that doesn't do anything other than follow up on what, what Peter just said. But I'll try it this way. What's lacking right now in Washington is only leadership ideas and a partnership with the private sector. Outside of that, they've pretty much got it figured out. Now, Let's talk about the people and the process, and then we'll get to how they see the substance and the problem. Because it starts, believe it or not, with people. The, um, I think the five top players in Washington that are emerging now, one of them is already a strong player, the others will follow, are, are not Hank Paulson despite his great skill and his round-the-clock hard work. The most important person right now is Barney Frank. And I'll tell you why that is. First of all, he's in a uniquely strong position. When you analyze a politician, it's, it's good to suspend your own opinion of that individual and your own opinion of his policies. Put that aside. Try to be analytical. Barney Frank is a hard-working person who has a purpose. He also has a unique amount of power. In the House of Representatives, when you're a committee chairman, particularly one that's that large, everything is about what you say. If you have two or three things you want, and you are very flexible on everything else, you can get what you want, and you can kill what you don't want. And he has that much power. Additionally, he has a relationship with a very strong political speaker, Nancy Pelosi, uh, is finding her way in this role. She is, this is the single most powerful position in the Congress, the Speaker of the House. He can dictate the rules under which everything is debated. And he has an ability with her that whatever he wants to do, she'll use her power to help him. So if he wanted to take a bill to the House floor later today, uh, he could do that if he had her convinced that was the right thing to do. And this is putting aside, remember, whether or not you like what he's doing or if you think he's up to it. And the next person down the line okay, is quite a bit uh, different, and that's Sheila Baer of the Federal Depository Insurance Corporation. It's 
a self-funding federal agency. They've taken over IndyMac. They're using IndyMac as the template for what they think every financial institution with significant mortgage holdings needs to do, which is essentially rework these loans, and if need be, one at a time, to have them take the hit on the loss of value of that security. Then you get to the next Treasury Secretary, whomever that is. And what I would predict to you that this is going to be an inversion of the usual Washington process. Ordinarily, any cabinet official is confirmed by the Senate committee and tends, as a result, to favor the Senate Banking Committee and the Senate Finance Committee, the, committee, the primary committees that they deal with. Part of the reason for this, by the way, is those two committees, Senate Finance and Senate Banking, have tended to be good functioning committees going all the way back to the Carter administration. They're smaller. There's, there's still a pocket of collegiality in a Congress that has become sadly uh, divisive and isolated. You know, I've spent, I'm a native Washingtonian. My parents are both from Scranton, Pennsylvania. Your classic Irish Catholic Horatio Alger story, hard work, education, the GI Bill, and, and um, my parents' five kids are all doing well because of that. That's the American dream. Right? So you come into the United States Capitol, and you're working there as a young person, as I was. You start to learn how the people in the process work. And it's a very different world than it is imagined from outside of it. It is very much a little bit like a great college where the faculty are very engaged with the students. That was the Congress I joined in 1978. There are only a few pockets now on the campus, which is the United States Congress, where that level of involvement, engagement, and personal interaction are still strong enough to help people solve problems. And two of those places are the Senate Finance Committee and the Senate Banking Committee. We'll see how they change in the months ahead. I'm hopeful that that kind of collegiality will continue. Even when they fight, even when they disagree, even when there's people's motivations being challenged, it's, it's for the political theater and it's from a genuine passion about an issue. It's, it's not a wholesale disregard for the other person's point of view on those committees. But in that, the, the downside of that level of collegiality is that even the chairman of that committee doesn't have a dominance over the other members of that committee the way the chairman in the House of Representatives. So Chris Dodd, who has been on that committee a great deal of time, who everybody in this room probably knows personally, uh, works very hard at it, is very good, very good staff, has got that spirit that the committee members need to come to a consensus and then that consensus from his committee is the basis of his power when he takes that bill to the Senate floor, representing not just his views, but the views of his committee. It's very different. Barney Frank, the power is personalized in him. So the key question is, what is it that Barney Frank wants? Because he's going to get it. And what is it that you need from him or want to share with him? And... What he wants is some resolution for the mortgage foreclosure problem. Think about these words. The phrase he uses is a mortgage prevent, a foreclosure prevention process. Now, if the problem began, as Peter outlined, and, and I think everyone, or probably most, would agree, with too many people with insufficient income borrowing too much too easily, at a temporarily reduced rate, therefore they have more house than they can afford on their income. How is having a, pro a process to prevent the foreclosure, to get that person out of that asset, going to solve the problem they cause? And the only way to look at it is, is that it addresses a different problem. It addresses a social concern. And you have to figure out what is it that you can do short of a complete prevention of foreclosure 
And that's where Sheila Fair's working relationship with Barney Frank is instructed. She took over IndyMac. She's using that as a template. She suggested that the city and Chase and the Bank of America, Barney Frank was cajoling the CEOs of those three financial institutions to follow the Indy Bank example. <clears throat> they began doing that. These are very sophisticated banks. Surely they're aware that one of the things they get out of this is some kind of better working relationship with this very powerful person. Now, I can't tell you that that is economically sensible or that it will result in some ultimate solution to this problem. But what I can tell you is that <clears throat> Supporting people who have political power, who can help solve your problem, or who can listen to your idea about the, how to solve a global problem, is a necessary part of the give and take of the human interaction. And that is very important in a political world. And if Barney Frank gets the one thing he wants, and as a strong chairman is capable of being flexible on the balance, and then that means that you're in the balance. And that one thing I would suggest to you is that uh, either individually or perhaps as a group, you try and figure out what are the three things that policymakers in Washington don't know that they should know, that you know. And then you have to ask, if you were to take that message to somewhere in Washington, where would you go? that if they were convinced by you, it would make a material difference in how they steered this vote. Uh, so I would suggest to you that, that, believe it or not, there is an insufficient number of people coming from the investment world into the political world at a time when the political world, believe it or not, is more receptive to ideas knowing that they only have a few. And if you look at the mortgage market as a relatively small piece of the global financial world, solve that problem for them, and they're less likely to victimize the other elements of the financial world, which they don't know that much about. Now, there's a little bit of this going on right now, this, this knee-jerk notion that when there's a large problem threatening the general public and they don't have a ready solution for it, the political response has been to get very prosecutorial, to pick out a villain and to pummel them, to then use that person or that individual. <coughs> and there are a number of contenders for which subset of the financial industry is going to be most victimized. And one of them, of course, is the hedge fund industry. Because it seems to be large, and as you've heard a million times, they say you're unregulated. They say you're not transparent. They say you're up to something. And this, this, if this, this spirit of ill will, combined with a lack of knowledge, combined with a fear that there's some bigger problem, combined with their own personal need, whether it should be there or not, it is real, to have a response when their voters come up to them and say, what are you doing about the problem? If they say, well, I'm, I've got the magic plan, I'm going to solve the problem, this will all be better by Tuesday, no one would believe them. If instead they change the subject and say, I've got my hands on the throat of the guy that caused this problem and I'm going to throw him in jail. They've changed the subject. They've made that voter think, aha, my person's on to this. And, and sometimes that's all they're looking for. So what is transparency to you? Because the, the political system wants to now regulate the hedge fund industry. The first word they use is an increase in transparency. To whom? Well, to the regulator? To the general public? To... to there, there, there's all sorts of groups already formed uh, that are working very hard to try to get ahead of this process, have it fill in some of these blinds. 
And all I would say is encourage you to get involved in whichever group your firms are already a member of. If you find some inadequacies, there's no harm in starting your round. Don't forget to coordinate with people. There is a real dire need in Washington and a greater receptivity to it than you might at first think. So, uh, sort of fill in the blank with who's number five on my top five sort of power personalities. Frank, Frank, Sheila Bear, whomever is the next Treasury Secretary, Chris Dodd, and fifth is Chuck Schumer. Now, I've worked very uh, frequently with his office. Uh, I happen to be a Republican. I've heard he's a Democrat. Uh, he's uh, a forceful personality, certainly. He's a very bright person. Uh, I would say that he has one skill that every successful politician has. You know, if, if they don't have this one attribute, they can't be a success in politics. And that is that when he picks a side in a fight, he stays on that side until the fight is over. Uh, and that's more rare than you would imagine. <laughs> and um, the, he sees his role as getting very engaged in the expected restructuring of regulation of the entire financial system. And some of the rhetoric that I'll say is different than what he was saying two years ago when he and Mayor Bloomberg unveiled a report that had been compiled by McKinsey and Company for them that called for a competitiveness as the focus, that we wanted to make sure that New York either kept or regained its leadership in the financial world. This followed up on a very good report done by Hal Scott at Harvard Law and by the Columbia Business School that talked about the threats and some non-legislative changes that the SEC could make to further improve the financial viability of the U.S. capital markets and to reassert our leadership. Chuck Schumer was aware of that report, wanted his own to focus some things in it, was smart to involve Mayor Bloomberg, and issued his report. That was just 2007 and how it seems like a decade ago. Because now no one's talking about competitiveness, sadly. No one's talking even about restoring health to the capital markets. They're talking about consumer protection. They're talking about transparency. Not just the need for more regulation, but a prosecutorial zeal for that regulation. One of the forces that's been at work for 10 years, mostly unsuccessful, sometimes in collaboration with some activist hedge funds, sometimes in collaboration with some leading plaintiff uh, class action attorneys. But behind the scenes, at the SEC, corporate proxies, any kind of governance issue, most regulatory issues, has been the AFL-CIO. You would maybe think that or know that, unless you've been involved in one of those particular fights. One of the attorneys that led that for the AFA of LCIO has just been appointed by Speaker Pelosi and the Senate Majority Leader, Harry Reid, to a very prominent position overseeing the Congressional Committee that is going to look into everything that Hank Paulson's done and presumably going to stay around long enough to chart what should be done next. So there's no doubt that those who want to regulate everything some of whom have a prosecutorial notion that there's something wrong that's been going on. We're going to find those people and put a stop to it. Is at odds with the notion of restoring health to the capital markets, ultimately getting back on that course to make us more competitive so that we can recapitalize the economy. It's important that we recapitalize banks, but only because we need to recapitalize the economy. So all of that is stopped, and there in there is a vacuum, I would suggest, that you fill. Uh, you've probably done this before. You'll probably need to do it more than you'd like. It might be a bit of a distraction from running your businesses in one way of analyzing it. But I'd, have, I'd ask you to look at it the other way. 
There is a prospect that Barney Frank, Chris Dodd, Chuck Schumer, Sheila Bear, and the next Treasury Secretary really are going to take a new piece of blueprint and write a new charter for the financial industry. They will call it a restructuring of the regulatory process. But it's not that. It's more than that. It is a restructuring of your lives, of your businesses, of the capital markets. Who wins? Who loses? Who's a villain? Who gets rewarded? And these things can seem, at times, maddening or purposeless or impossible. Uh, but it will become better with your involvement. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll end it up. Well, on that cheery note. <laughs> Thank you for being gloomier than I was. The, um, I'd, I'd like to start it off with a question that kind of you could take from your respective angles, which are quite different. You get the impression of, as an outsider, that one of the problems, particularly in a fast-moving period like this, is that it's difficult for policymakers to, to see where the puck is going as opposed to trying to skate to where the puck is now. How, Peter, do you, would you rate the process of the uh, executive in terms of being able to anticipate events and head them off? And do you think that that is a, a structural problem or a problem that people will remedy as they become more familiar with the process? And, Michael, in, from your point of view, in a situation as fluid as this, is the legislative branch really going to be able to deal with this kind of issue or at the, at the end of the day, will they relegate it to, to the executive and deal with uh, some kind of an overarching framework, uh, perhaps with a view of, of trying to correct the, uh, the, whatever they see as the deficiencies in the past? Um, it's um, uh, going to be very tough, even for a, a terrifically staffed Obama administration. Let's, uh, let's spot them that they're going to be a lot of smart people. They're going to have thought about their, their, their responsibilities well. It is really hard to um, uh, stay ahead, I mean, to try to be ahead where the puck is. Um, I, um, uh, so th they're always going to struggle with that. No matter how good, no matter how smart, no matter how close to the puck they're getting in your metaphor, it's, it's a challenge. Um, a friend once asked me what was the difference between working at the Fed and working at the Treasury, uh, and the Fed being insulated from Congress a little more than, uh, than the Treasury. And I, I had to think, because this person didn't work in finance or government, I said, well, the, working at the Fed's like um, playing Major League Baseball. There's some great athletes here, but it's bursts of athleticism, but mostly it's kind of a stately rhythm and a slow pace. Working at the Treasury and with Congress is like playing playground basketball. There are no timeouts. There are no substitutes. There are no umpires. And after a while, it feels like no one's even actually keeping score anymore. You're just going back and forth. Um, so it's pretty hard uh, to um, win that fight. Let me digress a little because I think uh, I want to echo what Michael was saying in, in, in a different way and anticipate. I mean, I think that um, – the challenge that an administration can grapple with, not in the details, uh, but is, I don't mean this literally, but at the level of metaphor, what's the metaphor? What, what, what's the impulse that's going to animate the financial reform? And I look back on the failures of Sarbanes-Oxley, and I feel this rather acutely. I share my, my, sen my sense of blame, having been Under Secretary of Domestic Finance at the time. Um, you know, you won't find it anywhere in the bill. You can't actually find this term. But what Sarbanes-Oxley did was say, well, corporate governance is a problem. Let's empower the second guessers. You know, let's empower the independent directors. Let's empower the auditors and the accountants, all the second guessers, and that's going to make it better. Um, and I think at the level of metaphor, kind of communicating what needs to happen, a blueprint, I urge you, as I think Michael was, but I think in forming, acknowledging, uh, to take a different metaphor, there have been some spectacular car wrecks in our financial system. We have a financial system. There are a lot of spectacular car wrecks in blazes. And so sitting around saying we don't think we need to improve highway safety, that it's good enough, is just not going to cut it with Barney Frank. Right? You, you, you won't get in his office to try to make the case that we haven't had a lot of car wrecks. 
What you could make the case for, and I'd say an administration can do this if they're clever and wise and marshal their resources, is, is make the following kind of argument. There have been a lot of wrecks, but putting a cop on every corner to hand out tickets is not going to improve safety, i.e. empowering the second guessers, or mandating that every financial car have two drivers, you know, the second guesser driver and the driver driver. <laughs> That won't work. And Barney Frank is smart enough to get that kind of a message and say, okay, that's right. So let's talk about, you know, highway safety and uh, how many left people can take a left turn. And we all have to admit that the rules of the road need to, we need a better framework uh, because we won't sustain it. Now, what's been going on now, which feels so chaotic, and I think the powers that be in my different phases by not getting ahead of this, they, it feels to us like, we're trying to drive, and they're changing the traffic rules in real time. You must turn left from this lane. No, you can't turn left from this lane. And that's chaotic for us and been destroying investor confidence and destroying the capital structure of our financial system. So, but an administration can set the framework. It's pretty hard to out-argue the staff of the Senate Banking Committee on the fourth subparagraph. They're going to control that one. Um, so those are, that's my reaction. Okay, well, keying off the traffic metaphor, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, someone in the Maryland Department of Transportation thought it would be a good idea to show the federal government what would happen if they rigorously enforced the 55-mile-an-hour speed limit between Washington and Baltimore, as they had been doing, threatening to cut off some federal aid because Maryland, like most states, was not dedicating, in the, in, in the view of the feds, enough police power to this important task. So they took six police cars and drove abreast in each of the six lanes at 55 miles an hour. In two hours, traffic was backed up below Richmond. <laughs> you cannot run this country and abide by the speed limits, okay? Um, and all I want is my own lane. <laughs> I'm willing to let you use it when I'm not. When I'm coming, remember whose lane it is. <laughs> this problem wouldn't exist if you'd get around somewhere else. A um, couple things. Let's just use Sarbanes-Oxley a little bit. There was the Oxley part of the bill, and there was the Sarbanes part of the bill. And then all hell broke loose when WorldCom collapsed, and the Sarbanes part of the bill was on the Senate floor. And that's when it got crazy. And to show you, you nobody steal this, by the way, the title of my book, is arresting the innocent. Okay? Whatever it is, the way these things work out is the winnings go to the people who are involved in the process. They do not go to the people who should get them. And often, the villain, if they're, and people are a lot less villainous, by the way, than they're accused of being, but the people who are seen as the villains can sometimes get rewarded. Who's the single biggest winner out of Sarbanes-Oxley? The accounting profession. What was the origin of the problem at all of these, at all of Enron and WorldCom? And why was it that they were any really different other than scale from the problems at Parmalat or 8 million other uh, companies that any short could identify quickly? It was the timing. It was, it was also useful in political theater. And it was the particular brazen nature of the CEO and the CFO of WorldCom that coupled on what had been perceived as the brazen activities of the senior leadership of Enron. So had they been unknown companies, had they been uh, did different personalities at the helm, uh, they might have escaped becoming such huge um, provocations to the political system that they would write a law so sweeping that, think about it, affects all the other companies and not them. Because they're dead and their people are on the way to going to jail. 
So you're imposing a law on the innocent. And you're imposing a new level of exactitude and cost, which, either in a minor way, according to some analysis, or in a major way, according to others, is an inhibition on being a public company in the United States. If you can be a privately owned company not subjected to these laws, meaning outside the United States, you're arguably better off. And that's not a good thing as a federal policy decision-making uh, outcome. So what you want here is a better process and a better result than that. And you only get better process by letting these people talk to each other. Now, a little word here about another often uh, assaulted uh, occupation, which is lobbyist. We had a presidential election. Senator Obama won it handily. Uh, it was a big sweep. No doubt that it's a mandate. It's a very large Democratic majority in the House and in the Senate, and they have every intent of making every use of that. Now, both Senator McCain and Senator Obama, in different ways, attacked the notion of lobbyists. And I once asked one of Senator McCain's uh, close friends, also a senator, what explains his ability at any moment to have a stray attack on the pharmaceutical companies. If you remember the debate with Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney made a fairly innocent, favorable remark about innovations in the pharmaceutical industry. And what did Senator McCain say? Does anybody remember? Pharmaceutical companies are evil. What accounts for that? I'm not, I'm not wanting to debate whether they are or not. I happen to believe they're... How can you be evil when your entire objective is to cure some disease or treat some ailment? But this is his notion. He said, we've got to remember that the only thing he's really ever been trained to do is to be a fighter pilot. So a bogey moves into his peripheral vision that doesn't, his computer doesn't tell him it's a friendly. He shoots it down. <laughs> So that helped me more than anything else. It made me realize that uh, that's not a good skill for a president to have. Uh, because everything's good. It's, you're not going to find a lot of utility for that. Uh, moreover, your impulse, is, everything comes at you from your peripheral vision. The only thing that we can say for certain for the next four years is that none of the issues they campaigned on will come up. <laughs> there will be nothing that will come at them and say, Mr. President, we've got a big one for you, but it's easy, it's all fixed, can you sign here? That will not happen. So, so, so they can't agree on the problem. They can agree that we're going to have a lot of regulation. They're going to be listening to a lot of people. The people who point the finger at the concept of business, at the concept of private capital are sitting next to or in the chairs of power. Now, that should cause you to be involved yourselves. One of the first hearings that Barney Frank did when he became chairman of the House Financial Services Committee was have a hearing on private equity. And I have one of my clients happens to be the private equity counsel. So, we worked hard to get the right witnesses. We ended up with the CEO of Dunkin' Donuts, who did a spectacularly good job, great story to tell, but more importantly, he told it well. Very much about saving a company, and, uh, an iconic company, certainly in this region of the country. And also at the table was Andy Stern. And he is one of the most important figures in political life. And his, his, his union, the Service Employees International Union, who's reported to have spent $250 billion million to elect Democrats and, and Senator Obama president. And he's this smart and purposeful man. He's got a $20 million, that's an estimate, public campaign against the private equity world and against Henry Kravitz and Carlisle in particular. And he wants something. And what he wants um, is more control over what private equity does and how it's rewarded, how it's taxed, how it's regulated. And people like this are involving themselves in a way, in a magnitude, that no one in this room uh, 
could or would do. But I, I would say that wherever you see this debate, however, however you line up, uh, to get personally involved, because it can only get better. And you, I will tell you, they, you will get a better reception if you are prepared than, than you might imagine, and you will make the outcome better. I'll throw it open to questions from the floor, of which I'm sure there will be many. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm sorry. I have a question about uh, uh, pension relief. Do you think there's any chance that we'll see any relief in this lame duck session? Uh, oh. oh, you mean uh, the pressure for corporations to pay in to bring up? Uh, I don't. I think they're afraid of it. Yeah. I don't know that they'll do it. I, I mean, a little caution on that. I worked on the Pension Reform Act of 2006. <coughs> It was a, a awkward process. I won't take you through, but it ended up fairly well. Uh, the, the chief antagonist, uh, who, who argued that um, not only should hedge funds not be able to take in a new money with, without becoming subject themselves to ERISA, but maybe they should all be subjected to ERISA, <coughs> is now on the oversight board overseeing Hank Paulson. So, a big change in outlook. So I think the, the, the perception that uh, pension funds be well capitalized so they can then act as, as fiduciaries to provide for these beneficiaries, uh, that's been the prevailing view. I think that there will be a lot of challenges to whether or not that's the right, the, the, the view that's going to be held by the team that's coming in. I think there will be people who want to challenge the, the investment decisions of pension fund managers. I think we're going to have a very strange debate about that. I, just, I, I don't think they'll get to that in a lame duck session. Uh, the, the agenda of the lame duck session is getting shorter and shorter. Um, it'll certainly be a topic widely debated next year. I think the administration is already signaling they're going to put their chips down on health care reform because that's going to be the shortcut for alleviating the burden on the big three automakers and uh, state municipal governments, if you can get to national health care somehow, you can lighten a lot of liabilities that way. Um, pension reform will probably take a back seat to that, but we'll be come to and the, they'll be debating it in the new Congress and the Finance Committee, but I don't know where it'll go. If you look at the way they dealt with the auto industry, think about this for a minute. You had the Congress already appropriated and authorized $25 billion. You had to first prove that you were a going concern about that. Uh, but if you could prove that, at least to the satisfaction of people who read your paper, you could get loan guarantees, but only for the purpose of creating the next generation of vehicles. That's an existing appropriation. The three auto executives and the union president come and ask for a different $25 billion, this time from TARP, with fewer restrictions except the exec comp and no golden parachutes and no gold out buying an NBA team or doing something crazy because we need it. And they testified at the Senate Banking Committee um, one day. Yesterday they testified before the, before the House Financial Services Committee. And it does not look like they're going to get anything. The Bush administration was saying, hey, we could reconfigure the first $25 billion, turn it into a revolving loan program. We know it's really for the next generation of vehicles, but you can't get to that right now. Why don't we let you tap that, and you can use that, pay that back, and that money's there, and then that'll be re lent out for the original purpose. The car companies, the union, Senator Reid and Speaker Pelosi, took offense to that, said, no, that $25 billion has got to stay dedicated to the purpose we created it for, but you should open up the tarp and give it to these companies. To which Hank Paulson then said, of my 350, the first tranche of the 700 billion that comprises the TARP, I've only got 50 billion left that's unallocated. I want to I wanna turn over the next 350 to the next administration. I don't want to dip that low into the well. Use, use the first 25 billion. So think about this. They agree these companies deserve some federal bailout. They know the public does not support that. They're all willing to do it, however. They're just dipping into a different pot of money. 
you've got three CEOs who are coming as close as they legally can to saying we're in such bad shape. You know, and then they have to stop because their lawyers are telling them what they can't say. But the implication is we not, we may not make it till January twenty. And still the political system can't come together and find a compromise. What they can find is something they can fight with each other over and point fingers at each other. And and somehow we I think, frankly, uh, we need to change that because it's this inability to talk to each other or find some agreement that has disgusted the public, wherever you are on the ideological spectrum, and and which is that which they, they continue to have the same bad behavior, even on issues where they agree. And and so you get into something like pensions, as important as that is, big a problem as that is, they they can't process that. Or what, what about all these falling assets on which state and local governments tax the assets for property taxes, and that revenue stream is backing the munis? That's as far as you can take the conversation in Washington. They get so scared about what that would mean, they don't even want to hear about it. Yeah. I was curious, do people in this room, consistent with the hedge fund managers that testified earlier this week, would make the case that the problems that have come up were, as, you, as Peter indicated, leverage in the banking system. And the short sellers happen to recognize that and some profit from it. And I'm curious from both of your perspectives, but Michael, you indicated there might be some things that we know that people in Washington don't know. Uh, to the extent that we think that is a truth, are people involved in the debate of what will happen to the hedge fund industry aware of or recognizing the fact that it's possible to have a problem within the banking system? And then related to that, is there any discussion about transparency in the banking system as opposed to in the hedge fund industry? Well, I think we ought to be um, pause a minute and admit that the banking system is more than just the chartered banks. and. In aggregate, they lent too much money to a bunch of entities, some of which were hedge funds. So and that, that, that creates a liquidity illusion. We all can sell at the same time. Um, I think that a challenge we all face is persuading Congress to reform, uh, to think about the financial system as a whole, as Michael was saying, to think about a framework for the prudent management of all quasi-banks, whether they be hedge funds or conduits or REITs or sieves or broker-dealers or swap codes like AIG, FP, um, that, uh, yeah, a bank uh, takes deposits and makes loans, but everyone, as Jimmy Durante said, everyone wants to get into the act. You know, a lot of people now figured out how to borrow short and lend long on leverage, um, and that's actually why we regulate banks, because it turns out that's a risky activity when the economy downturns. Um, so I think if... If we can step back, uh, I would urge you all to think about how to make the case to Congress, as, as Michael's been suggesting, that there is a framework for supervising quasi-banks, hedge funds or some, REITs or some. Um, it's not that complicated. It's like how you regulate a bank, but we don't want it to be just the same. That would be counterproductive. You can have um, – there's the riskiness of the assets, how long durated they are and how risky they are, how volatile they are. Uh, there's your liquidity, your redemption schedule, and um, then there's capital. And a money market mutual fund is a quasi-bank. Maybe it should have 0.0% capital to avoid the problem of breaking the buck. We could think about that kind of framework. Hedge funds over the last 10, 15 years have evolved to a much more disciplined set of redemption rules than we used to have. Um, that's like, remember, your passbook savings account you used to say when your parents opened one for you. It said you could only withdraw so much on any one day. It's just like a hedge fund uh, that has a disciplined redemption schedule. So there's a framework, and it's got to apply to all those animals. It could be self It can come in different forms, but the banking system is going to have to figure out how not to just lend money to everybody and think it can make money, you know, make it up on volume when they lever themselves up too far. So we've taken um, some of the most storied names in investment banking and turned them into bank holding company, and we did that defensively. Now, how are we going to recapitalize this country with a bunch of utilities? Because that's what they are. You're a bank holding company. You're a utility. And the reason you're not lending is who are you going to lend to? Because you're looking at that earnings stream 
it's your security that your loan will be repaid and your interest will be paid to you. And you don't you don't see the economy creating the, enough borrowers that are viable in this market to make those loans. So you don't. It doesn't matter how many public officials cajole you to do it. There's no penalty for not doing it. And there's an enormous penalty for having the next set of regulators accuse you of being an inept manager. So I think the answer to from my point of view, um, and I say this not as an expert in your world, as a true amateur in your world, meaning that I love it but I don't understand it, is you got to sell yourselves. It's, a, it's time to change the name, by the way, since most hedge funds don't hedge or everybody does hedge. And what's a hedge fund? Your asset manager. And people understand that uh, people come out of large institutions when they need different structures and they benefit from them, okay? It's not unlike myself and my 20 partners, you know? A generation ago, we would have all been in a very sizable law firm, but there's simply too much cost to it, and uh, there's no benefit to that. There's no cross-selling that goes on, so why do that? So you go out and start your own thing, and you end up serving yourselves and your clients better. So, 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 so make them understand that there's a value to your clients and ultimately the economy and the way you're structured and the, what is it that you do for others. Start off with that. And then get into, you know, if you can, see your way to supporting what powerful people want that they want for social reasons, which they're also going to get anyway. I mean, I don't know that we should have an ideological battle about rewriting individual mortgages as if that's some grave sin we should make. When, when you have someone who's, a, who's a, like Chris Cox, a Reagan Republican, who partially because he's been told to and partially out of fear and partially because he has this crazy notion that he should be even tougher than Spitzer would be were he in that job, who has this ad hoc, willy-nilly set of restrictions on short sales. Just it's reckless, uh, and you know, one day the rule is this, and then you think it's not going to be extended, and then then it gets extended to 799 banks, and suddenly it grows over that. And then, what was the process there? The government is the only institution where people aren't saying be more transparent. And they also need to be more predictable. And, and the, 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 the complete opacity of their process and, and, and the unpredictable nature of these outcomes, uh, you know, is, I think, a con con considerable destabilizing a factor in the economic world. And I just offer that up as an amateur. No, I, I, the, the, this gets solved uh, more by people becoming engaged than, frankly, even the next great idea. It's, it's a willingness to say, okay, collectively we'll support the solving of the subprime borrower's dilemma and the foreclosure. Uh, if we do that, can we have a say-so in how our industry is restructured? And crazy as it is, I think the answer to that would be, sure, that's a deal. I'm interested in what Peter's expectations are when managing fixed income portfolios for inflation slash deflation are today. Um, I uh, it's um, I'm certainly worried about the uh, the risk of a two percent ten year note. Um, I'm um, I. A lot of what's been going on the last few weeks is flight to quality. That's pretty easy uh, to, to figure that out. That's not rocket science. Um, but uh, we already have a, a negative uh, inflation print. Um, I think that what's happened to commodity prices is likely to give us a number of negative inflation prints over the next 10, 12 months. Um, and I think that uh, whether it's some combination of flight to quality, delevering, um, and um, 
deflation and Fed reaction. That is, the Fed cannot sit by and watch us experience a 4 or 5 or 6 percent real rate. That will crush our economy. That will give us the Great Depression if we look at real rates that high. Um, so they're going to keep expanding their balance sheet, uh, doing quantitative easing um, uh, until they make sure that doesn't happen. That, you know, the long run real return of capital is 2.5%. Uh, that's fair value on the real return on tips, kind of 2.5% of real return, the real component. Um, so I think they're going to try to push it down under that. Um, the question is, will the rest of the market uh, help them out? Um, the wrinkle that, that um, I haven't fit, worked my way through, it's easy for us to sit here and say, well, there's going to be a lot of Treasury supply coming. You know, a trillion dollars they're going to borrow next year. Boy, that's going to frighten all of us investors. Uh, the, the question is, is there going to be any private borrowing? Uh, or are we going to get that debt to income ratio down by a complete cessation of dissaving in the private sector and borrowing? And I think we're going to see a pretty profound collapse in borrowing, in net new borrowing. Uh, and so, frankly, investors in aggregate aren't going to have a lot of choice uh, but to buy the government guaranteed stuff. Um, so I think that gives us a, a, it's a pretty good fight. Um, but I think I'm on the bottom end of that range. I want to be clear some of my partners managing the fixed sum are not. You know, they, they think the risk of a, of a four or five. 5% 10-year notes next year um, is, uh, is, is, is the one we should be focused on. Um, something else we're going to have to get used to, which we're not, is the volatility of GDP and the macroeconomic volatility we've got to price into the market. Uh, we've been smoothing out consumption with debt for 25 years. Uh, we're not going to get to do that. Uh, the, the private sector is not going to do that. The household sector is not going to do that. And that means we're going to return to uh, uh, the markets in which there's just a lot more volatility quarter to quarter in consumption and income. And, that, and we're going to watch that bounce around in the fixed income markets. Um, so uh, we may well have to brace ourselves for both me and my partners being right. That we're going to see a 2.5% 10 year note and we're going to see a 5% 10 year note all in the next 12 months. Uh, because we're going to bounce around. We don't know how much fiscal stimulus the government's going to put in. We don't know how much it will be front-loaded, how much it will be back-loaded. We don't know whether we're going to have a minus 4% GDP quarter this quarter or minus 8 because we just aren't that good at predicting the present. Uh, the collapse of retail sales and consumption is just really rapid. So I, I, I want to be make sure you understand that normally we all take our economic forecasts with a grain of salt. And we're kidding ourselves if we don't realize the uncertainty bands have just widened out dramatically over what's going to happen to us in the next two years. And that's probably the most important investment implication to think about. Well, Steve, you, uh, you had a closing question. I did. I have a, thanks, Paul. I have a, uh, a comment to Michael and a question to Peter. Uh, Michael, we, uh, the group here is uh, a group of investors. We're the investors who invest in private equity and in hedge funds. And we've, um, people like David, John, have gone down to Washington. We've talked to policymakers. We've had bizarre experiences with legislators. And um, it's not been uh, a pleasant exercise. It, it, the group as a, as a whole tends to not want to raise its hand or stick its head up uh, for fear of getting um, knocked off. But... If there's anything that we do believe, it's investors performing their due diligence on managers is the clearing mechanism in the marketplace. So uh, there's, no, there's no firewall between investors and a loss other than doing their homework and checking up with a manager. If you, if you like to carry that message to some people, that's, that's one of our beliefs also. Uh, Bob Humpler represents our chairman of the corporate pension plan. <coughs> They're a little more active than we are in Washington. Uh, question for Peter. What, um, can you walk us through the logic of eliminating the 30-year bond and perhaps the wisdom of either introducing a new one or, uh, or not? <laughs> yeah, I'd rather be remembered as the guy who tried to uh, 
kill the 30-year bond than the guy who stuck his finger in the dike at long-term capital. Um, um, uh, it's pretty simple. What, what, what I learned was um, government work is not finesse work. It's not surgery. It's rugby. Um, and you would better plan on staying for eight years if you want to do finesse work. Um, the 30-year is the stupidest damn thing the taxpayer uses. Um, if you're going to lend money to your brother for 30 years and he tells you he doesn't want to pay you principal back until the end, you kind of charge him a different interest rate than if he's going to pay you principal back over time. Now, even if you think your brother's a great credit risk, if you work really hard, you figure out getting that lump of principal back 30 years from now is going to give you a pretty bad reinvestment risk. Right? You're not going to know what kind of investment environment is that 30 years from now. So the raw deal the taxpayer gets is that the uncertainty premium at the 30-year point is about the highest you can imagine. If a, I'm happy to have the federal government borrow perpetuities. 100-year bond, as long as we pay down principal evenly over the 100 years or over the back 50 years would be terrific. But the 30-year bond is just an archaic stupidity that the Treasury came up with when they threw spaghetti against the wall in the early 70s and came up with every instrument under the sun. And the reason the street loves it is because they strip the IO and the PO and they get to trade the volatility on the principal only. And, and that overprices the interest only strip. So it's not about not liking long-term borrowing. It's about that instrument is flawed and really expensive from the taxpayer's point of view, and it's silly for the taxpayer uh, to take out that premium on the lump uh, that's going to come back to the investor 30 years hence, and we could have a lot smarter instruments. I argued for a long time with the lawyers. I said, please, let me issue perpetuities. Let me, that would be terrific. Uh, let me sell annuities. Let's replace savings bond with annuities for the American people, so a smart uh, instrument. Um, there are all kinds of things the government can do to get a long-durated asset out there. Um, but let's be clear, it's not about feeding the hedge funds when you're looking at it from the taxpayer's point of view, not about trading the vol on the PO. Is that, that a succinct enough answer? It's on the record. Well, I'd like to thank the, uh, our panelists for a, I think, illuminating and, and candid uh, discussion this morning. I think everybody comes away from it both understanding the process better than we did coming in. And uh, with any, I'll hand it back to Steve for any closing words. Thanks, Paul. And, uh, thank you very much for, for making it here today. And I want to uh, thank David Cottrell and his colleagues at the City Private Bank for, again, underwriting these really great think sessions, high-level discussions. Oh, hello, David. I didn't see you there. I'm sorry. And um, now we, we're really very, very grateful for your giving us the blank check to do this sort of thing. Um, we don't have much to say today other than that we're about to introduce the uh, Quinnipiac survey very soon. Keep your eyes on, the, um, on your mail. And um, secondly, we'll meet back here on December 11th uh, to talk. Our topic will be uh, Long-term investing, how I learned to stop worrying and ignore volatility. <laughs> so we'll see you here on December 11th. Thank you very much, Paul, for putting this together. Thank you.